you so much, Valeria. Beautiful song. There is freedom. If you want to be free, look to Jesus. Today we're continuing our series on the Ten Commandments called Love and Law. Today's message is God's holy space in time. I invite you to bow your heads with me for prayer. Our Father in heaven, I know I venture onto sacred ground and talking about things that are holy because I am not, but you are. And you are merciful and gracious. You have promised to make us holy as we put our lives in your hands. And so today, speak to us. Show us what that looks like. In Jesus' name, amen. We learned early on in this series that the law of God is an expression of who he is, his character of love. That's why I titled it Love and Law. But as you go through scripture, you not only find these two things together, you find another word, something else that God uses to describe himself. And that word is holy. Love, law, and a God who is holy. You see, when Moses met God at the burning bush, God tells him, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. You see, not just the ground is holy, but the place where you stand is holy. We see throughout the Bible that God's presence and his holiness go hand in hand. Where he appears, it's a holy place because of his holy presence. It doesn't surprise us then that Paul sums up God's law in Romans in this way. Therefore the law, he says, is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and good. God's love, God's law, God's holiness are inseparable from his character as revealed in the Ten Commandments. God gives us a high standard to measure up to. He started this early on. The standard of, for God's people has always been high. Can you imagine if God set a low standard? Well, if he just you know, 10% or something, all of us would be aiming which direction? Low, what the least we could do, you know. If I'm just a good person, I'll get into heaven. If I just am okay here or there, God doesn't see my faults in these areas. No, God is holy. And his law is not only just an expression of his love, but a, an expression of his holiness, his holy character. So he says in Leviticus 11.45, speaking through Moses, he says, For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. This is the same language, by the way, used to, the begin, to begin the commandments. I'm your God who brought you, who delivered you from Egypt. And then he says, You shall therefore be holy, for I am am holy. Each of us knows, I think intuitively, that we are not holy. <laughs> Innately, we have no holiness in and of ourselves, except that God has made us holy. He has given us his holiness. And this has always been his goal, to mold and to shape his people into his holy image, his holy character, to write his holy and just and good commandments on the minds and hearts by his Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, finish it with me, God Almighty. In my study for the message today, I couldn't but help taste 
a little bit of Moses' experience at the burning bush. I discovered some new things in relation to the, the seventh the, the seven day Sabbath, the fourth commandment. New things that I never really thought about before. And everything seemed to be pointing to me to holiness, holiness, and God's holy day. It's the one place in the Ten Commandments that the holy God is named or identified here as having a holy day. The commandments are more than a set of laws, but a picture of the results of the transforming power of God at work to make his people holy. And specifically, the Sabbath commandment reveals that our God, who is holy, has brought us close to himself in his very presence as we observe his Sabbath. Exodus 31 Verse 12, if you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me. It will be on the screen, as it always is. But Exodus 31, verses 12 and 13, really bring this home to me. It really, the the epiphany happened at this verse. And I want to share it with you. Exodus 31, verse 12, and we'll read 13. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who does what? Who sanctifies you. Now, we might say, okay, well, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Do you know what the word sanctify means? To make holy. You see, the Sabbath is a sign that I'm the God who makes you holy holy. So not only is this my holy day, it's the day that you enter into this special time and place where I make you holy too. After creating the world in six days, God did something special. After creating Adam and Eve, He brought them together in marriage, another holy uh, sacrament, so to speak. Holy rite instituted by God after creation. But he wasn't done. He had one more thing to do, as we know, in Genesis 2, verse 1. It says, The heavens and the earth and all of them were finished, And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. You see, you have to to go back in your mind's eye to what's going on here. Just the day before, God creates Adam and Eve and he brings them together in marriage and they spend the rest of that day together and then what happens that evening? The Sabbath is established and God invites Adam and Eve into his presence and says, this is the day I'm setting aside to spend with you. You are holy This day is holy, and I've blessed it so that when we commune together on this day, something special every week happens. He not only blessed the seventh day, it says that he sanctified it. The day itself is set apart as holy. God's people are holy, the day is holy. Is it any wonder where God says, come and and spend time with me so we can experience holiness together? God created a holy space in time. A space that is holy because he inhabits it. 
God, this God who created us and loves us, who asks us to set aside on our, our everyday regular activities. He wants to keep us connected with the one and only source of life, himself. And in doing that, he can then work in us to make us who he wants us to be. We are special. Humankind is special. And God gave mankind a Sabbath so that forever we would remember him, the one who created us, and his goal, the one who seeks to make us holy. After living in Egypt as slaves to Pharaoh, God delivers his people with a mighty hand and leads them to Mount Sinai. Didn't take them long to get there. We find it's about a month. They arrive in Mount Sinai. And he there, he speaks his Ten Commandments from the top of the mountain with great lightning and thunder, a display that created fear throughout Israel. And at the heart of those commandments, by the way, God didn't intend to make them fearful. They just were. I think fear is a, can have its good and bad elements, doesn't it? God doesn't want us to be afraid, but he wants us to respect and honor him, doesn't he? I think they were probably a little of both. <laughs> but we find in the heart of the Ten Commandments is the Sabbath. And I put up this slide, I think on the very first message of this series. But I want you to notice something else. The Sabbath in the middle here is a bridge between God and mankind. It, it, is, it is a teacher, a, 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 an invitation to cross from what we are to what we can be in God. So it's placed exactly in the Ten Commandments where God wants it to be placed. It is one of the three positive commandments that seem to separate the commandments into three parts, but this, this, one, this one commandment, this fourth commandment, is that bridge between God and mankind. It reveals God's desire to work continually to nurture the love relationship that he has with each and every one of us. That's really what the Sabbath is about. Time with our creator, our God who loves us. The commandment itself, thank you, Sosiah, for reading it, in 20, verse 8, Exodus 20, verse 8, it says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. It's an interesting word to start off with, remember. What does that tell you initially? What's your thought? You know, remember. That we're prone to forgetting, right? Here's something else. How can you remember something if it doesn't already exist? Because there's this notion out there that the Sabbath is for the Jews. But the commandment itself doesn't point to the Jews as a nation. It points to creation. It's been there. And God calls his people to remember the Sabbath day. To keep it holy. You can't keep something holy that already that isn't already holy, right? Again, pointing back to how God sanctified the seventh day at creation. 
And it goes on. It says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of who? Of the Lord your God. Who does the Sabbath belong to? God himself. It's his day. You know, I, I hear, as you may at, from time to time, well, it's nice that you can observe your Sabbath. I have my Sabbath. You heard that one? I don't have a Sabbath. I don't have one. You don't have one. And anyone who chooses their own day doesn't have one. They might try to claim one, but they don't have a Sabbath either. Because the Sabbath belongs to the Lord our God. It's his day. He chose it. In fact, as I look back on Rochelle and I, we were married uh, on June 25, 1995. I don't think she'd like it very much if I announced to her, honey, I'm, I'm going to spend time with you in celebration of our wedding, our marriage, on December 1. She said, why are you doing that? I don't know, I just, I feel like it. We're going to change it. Why would we want to change that? I mean, we were married on June 25. We can't observe another day to celebrate our marriage. That's, we're locked in. And I want to tell you, the world before sin was locked in to time and communing with God, our creator. And we cannot change that no matter how the devil tries. It says in the Sabbath, continuing on with verse 10, you shall do no work, nor you, nor your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your cattle, your stranger who's within your gates. And why is that? Because in six days the Lord made. He did his creative work. The heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, a direct reference back to the creation week. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This pattern of six days for work plus a seventh day for rest remains to this day. There is no celestial body or movement of the world or universe or anything that determines a week, right? We have a day. What is the day determined by? Rotation of the earth. What about the moon? I mean, the, uh, um, the month. The moon, right? What about the year? Our rotation around the sun. So tell me about a week. The only re reason a week exists is because God established it. He asks us to work six days and rest on the seventh. And when we rest, it's a symbol of giving up support for ourselves and shifting our focus to God who supports and sustains us. He wants us to remember that not only did he create us, he will take care of us. We can rest in him. So all these things, you know, I don't know why this is, but some, it's our nature probably. But it seems like everybody wants to know, okay, so what is it that I can do on this, what am I supposed to do on the Sabbath and what am I not supposed to do on the Sabbath? Okay, come on, you have your own mind checklist as to what's acceptable and what's not to do on the Sabbath. And we just go there. It's, it's easier that way. Just give me the list, tell me what to do, God, and I'll do it. And I, I love the way God works in this because he doesn't give us a list. He gives us principles. He gives us principles 
for remembering and observing the Sabbath, keeping it holy. As I was beginning my journey back to Christ, back in the early 90s, I remember being convicted and started going to church again and spending time with God on his Sabbath. And I was asked to go to participate in a basketball tournament on a weekend. Uh, it starts Saturday and it ends on Sunday. And so, you know, as the human mind continues to weigh whether or not you can do something, we, we're prone to talking ourselves into something rather than out of something, right? We all, we all confess that. So I talked myself into going ahead and just participating in the tournament. You know what? I mean, while I'm playing basketball, I'll witness. <laughs> And so as soon as I stepped onto that court and we started to play, the witness went out the door and the competitive juices started to flow and I took it to my opponent. And I realized I hadn't thought once about spending time with the Lord. I discovered that it doesn't work when there's distractions around me everywhere. It is hard to keep the Sabbath and honor God and his holy day. I also realized that God, in his effort to establish the Sabbath, wants to separate us from normal work days. He wants to separate these two things, common and regular, and that which is holy. And when you're doing all the stuff that you always do, we make the Sabbath common. But when we set all the stuff that we are used to doing aside, we allow ourselves to receive the holiness of God who desires to make us holy just by the mere fact that we're in his presence. God separated the Sabbath and he also wants to separate me from the other six days of normal work as he molds and shapes me in his image. There is no specific verse in it except that God is, is using the Sabbath as a sign of him who sanctifies us, who changes us, who makes us holy, who makes us, who reforms us in his character. There's no verse beyond that idea that says that something special happens in here on the Sabbath, specifically. But all of us know that when we spend time with God on this day, something is happening. Right? We sense God with us in a way that goes deeper than the other six days. It is true. You can worship God any day of the week. The Sabbath is the one day God says, you join me in my decision to create this holy day and make you holy. Isaiah 58 if you go through this, this chapter, it's an amazing chapter, actually, because God starts off by, and he does this a lot in Isaiah, he starts off by recounting the, 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 the errant ways of his people. Because they look good, they talk it up, but they don't measure up. Their life is not what they profess. And so, you know, he goes through there and he talks about, you know, doing justice and standing up for those who are oppressed. And that's the real fast that he has chosen for his people. And then you get to the rest of this, ver uh, this, uh, this chapter and you realize, wait a minute, the Sabbath takes on a little different or fuller meaning because of where it's placed here. So if God wants to make his people and have his people experience all that he desires them to be, not just the front that they put on, 
And then he brings up the Sabbath. There must be something in the Sabbath that changes them, right? Read with me from Isaiah 58, verse 12. Those from among you will build up the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. This is a breach that has occurred between God and his people where they are no longer acting or living or thinking like him. This breach needs to be restored. Something needs to happen so that I can intervene, grab a hold of them again, and make them who they are designed to be. And then look at this next verse, verse 13. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then... You shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. It's almost like he's saying, if you want to experience all the blessings that I have to give you, quit quit defiling the Sabbath, become who who I intend you to be, and let me work on you. Spend this time with me. And of course, the devil stands by and says, I need to do everything I can to distract these people from spending time with their creator. Get them focused on all the stuff of the world and what they're used to doing. Not doing your own ways, not doing your own pleasure, not speaking your own words, And when you give your all in these areas to God, the result is a blessing. There is a blessing that comes by remembering and observing the Sabbath. Anything you find distracting from spending time with Jesus is for another day. When your job on the Sabbath has you thinking more about money you need to earn to sustain your life rather than trusting in God as your provider, you need to take your foot off the Sabbath. When you attend a sporting event to praise the players on the field rather than the Lord who deserves your highest praises, you need to take your foot off the Sabbath. When you go shopping for things you think you need when the God who created you has set aside a special time for satisfying your deepest spiritual need, you need to take your foot off the Sabbath. Are you with me? You see, Jesus corrected many of the misconceptions about the Sabbath and what it meant back then. And I believe today we're also losing the meaning of the Sabbath. We think just because we realize that the day is the the right day is the Sabbath, the seventh day, that we're okay. Well, so did all of Israel who celebrated that day every week. And yet, God said, I have a bad taste in my mouth with how you act. It's not about being right. It's about what the day is to God and what he wants to do with us when we spend that day with him, honoring that holy day. Jesus said to the Pharisees who were creating, it seemed like law after law for how to observe the Sabbath. He says to them in Mark 2, 27, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. If you want to break that down, in essence, what he's saying is all your laws mean nothing. Because the Sabbath was created so that I could spend special time with my created beings, the ones I love, not so they can conform to everything or I wouldn't accept them.
The Sabbath is a time to delight in our God. Amen? A list of do's and don'ts don'ts make this time more mechanical. Where God intends it to be relational. I was looking it up, you know, what are the laws today for Sabbath observance among Orthodox Jews? And they have what's called 39 melakot. That is, 39 categories of activities that are prohibited by Jewish law for the Sabbath. And these are where the things are found where you, you know, you're not supposed to turn on a light or do anything that causes a mechanical process or electricity to happen or combustion to happen or anything like that. And they're so focused on this. In fact, Rochelle's students asked her one time, you said you keep the Sabbath? How do you keep the Sabbath? She says, well, I spend time with God. It came after another question where they asked her, asked her, how do you pray? What do you mean you pray to God? How do you do that? Because remember, their prayers are prepared routine, rhythmic prayers that are pre-learned. And she says, I just talk to God. Talk to God. So when she said, yeah, I keep the Sabbath. I said, well, what do you do? Do you you drive in a car? She goes, yes, I have to get in the car to get to church. Well, then you don't keep the Sabbath. You see, the Sabbath is about time with God. God, I, don't, I want to emphasize this. I keep emphasizing this. Time in the presence of a holy God so that he can make us holy. And any distractions that come in interrupt that process. So when we make the day a day for doing all the other stuff we do all the other days, we interrupt something that God wants to do special in us. So lists won't do it. You want to know what my simple principle is for Sabbath keeping? You're probably going to accuse me of being oversimplifying things. Here's what it is. Anything that distracts you from communing with God, spending time with God, in other words, an awareness of his presence, is not acceptable for Sabbath. Does that work? Knowing what we know about the Sabbath, it's our time together, anything that distracts us from that time is unacceptable. And I'm not saying this in a legal list way. I'm saying you need to talk with God about this day and what he wants to do with you on this day from week to week. And he'll make it clear what should be in and what should be out. Now, God does put parameters, principles around the Sabbath hours. These principles we can use to understand what it means to keep it holy. Jesus talked about healing on the Sabbath. And he spent time, you know, uh, out there ministering to people's needs and and healing, visiting the sick. Uh, These things are, are, are clear throughout the story, the gospel story. And so we we do have examples of what Sabbath keeping looks like. Those are good things for us to do. And we can use these principles to guard the sacred hours of the Sabbath to make sure that nothing interferes with our time with him. But but I want to make sure that what our focus is during this, this special time with God every week, our focus is on him our creator, the one who loves us and gives us all that we need. And when we spend our time with him and focused on him, that is when the Sabbath becomes a delight. I know it's great not to have to work. (laughs) But that's really a way to get us to where we can spend time with God, right? That's really what not working is about. I believe that if we're willing to explore the full meaning of the Sabbath, we will see just how important it is in the life of every Christian today. 
The fourth commandment in Exodus 20 connects the Sabbath with the Creator and the creation week. But if you want to go a little deeper into what the meaning of the Sabbath is, you need to read Moses' account as he iterates the Sabbath commandment in Deuteronomy 5. Because there is a little difference. And I want to read that for you here today. This is what Moses understood about the Sabbath. In other words, he's taking in the full meaning of the Sabbath. And here's what he says as he, um, it's not a word for word at all, but he's, he's expressing what God has said about the Sabbath here in Deuteronomy 5. Verse 12, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor any stranger that is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. See the little difference there? What is the reason that he adds that you don't allow them to work? So that they may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commands you to keep the Sabbath day. What's missing? Come on, it's easy. What's missing? Any reference to creation. There is none. What is put in its place? Deliverance. Deliverance from Egypt. And so what God sees in this is not just the Sabbath as a memorial of creation and his creative power, but a memorial of his recreative power in us to deliver us from sin, from what holds us back, from what keeps us from becoming what he knows we can be if we let him change us. The Sabbath is so much more than just about creation. That's half of it. It's important. It's about a recreation of his image in us. And that's why, my friends, when you're talking about end time events, Revelation 13, the beast has an image, but God is creating his people in his image. And the difference between the two is the day of Sabbath observance. That's why the battle comes to a head in this commandment in the last days. And if we understand the fullness of this and we can explain by God's word, first in our own minds, but to others, to share the beauty of the Sabbath and the holiness of God and his desire to change us, I think maybe more people will listen because we're not arguing about the day. We're arguing about what it means. And that meaning has never changed. You'd have to change God to change the meaning of the Sabbath. My friend, David Asherick, he sums it up. I, I love the way he gets to the point at times. He says, the fourth commandment is rest and give rest. Rest in God, right? And allow others, give others rest so they have an opportunity to rest in God. So think about that as a kind of a principle. What am I doing? Am I doing things that force others to work? Isn't it, is, that a good, is that a valid question to ask? Or am I allowing other people to rest around me as I observe rest myself? And of course, rest that we're talking about is not just physical rest, it's a spiritual rest. It's spiritual refreshment. Even God said that on that day that he, for, that he created the Sabbath, he established the Sabbath, he rested and was refreshed. Do you think he was refreshed because he was tired? God doesn't get tired. He was refreshed by the connection, by the relationship he had with his creation. Isn't there something just restful about solid, loving family and friend relationships? And that's how he rests on this special day. 
God is inviting you today into his holy presence. In this holy space and time that he's established every week. And when you say yes to joining him on his holy day, you connect yourself with his plan of redemption and restoration in your life. And I want to be changed. I don't want to just be, you know, declared holy, which he does initially when you give your life to him. That's what justification is all about. I want him to make me holy, like to be like God in character. That's what I desire. And I'll tell you what, he's not done. I got a lot of long ways to go. But I know that every day that I live, I live in the presence of God. And then when I come and meet him on the Sabbath, we've got a lot to talk about. And some wonderful things that he has to share with me as he prepares me for another week. My challenge to you is to accept his invitation today into that deeper meaning, the deeper fullness of the Sabbath with your creator experiencing God's love and grace as he changes you from week to week. Father in heaven, Lord, we don't want to make the Sabbath just about being right about a day. I think the world's had so much of hearing that. And maybe there's a time and place to talk about the Sabbath being the seventh day, of course, that's the Bible's clear on that. But Lord, help us to understand the depth of what you mean as you call us into Sabbath with you, a rest with you. That you want to change us and make us your holy people because you are our holy God. Oh Lord, begin that change today. Reformat our mind change our heart and make us who you want us to be so that from week to week when this day comes that we can rejoice and delight in the time that we can spend with you not because we get to stop working that's good but it's not the best the best is because we get to spend this time with you the one who loves us and bestows his grace upon us above life for himself, even. So, Lord, we thank you and we receive you anew on this Sabbath day. Lord, bring your holiness into our lives as we spend this time with you. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen. <laughs>